Understanding the carburetor. This is a difficult video to do. Not because carburetors are difficult to understand. They're actually very simple. It's difficult to do because there are so many variations spread over so many different years and generations and models and everything else. Configurations of carburetor, you know, one barrel, two barrel, four barrel, uh, three barrel, Hollies, Edelbrocks, Weber's, Carter's, I mean, Stromberg's. There's so many different variations to all of this. But this is a video we had a lot of requests for because a lot of you younger guys are mystified by these carburetors. You understand electronic fuel injection, you understand throttle position sensors and oxygen sensors and feedback. You get all that. Dog's bark. Um, but the carburetor is a mystery. And a lot of you older guys as well. You know, you've been screwing up the stuff your whole life, but you never actually got inside the carburetor to see what, you know, what do each of these systems do? So what I did was I picked this Carter BBD, um, mostly because I had it sitting on my shelf and it's clean. Um, and contained within this device are all of the systems that match the systems on your carburetor, whether it's a Holly or an Edelbrock or a Rochester or any of them. Uh, all carburetors have basic systems and basic circuitry. So. This is not a video telling you how to rebuild your carburetor. Um, it's not a video on how to fix your carburetor. It's not a video on how to tune your carburetor. Um, it's a primer course on the basic functions universal to all automotive carburetors. Um, so, where do we start here? Okay, uh, we'll start with the external controls. And again, your carburetor, regardless of what it looks like, or what the make is, is going to have similar systems. And it's up to you to do the Google and the research to figure out how this applies directly to your carburetor. But let's start with the with the with the external controls, right? With the, exter the external devices. And then we'll work our way inside. Um, so starting with the most basic piece of all is the idle stop screw. Okay, this is the one that you set when you turn in, you know, when you, this is the one you turn when you're setting your idle speed. Now, in theory, right, um, it's, okay, so right there is just zero. Okay, in theory, when this thing is set at the stop, the blades are closed just to where they would start to contact the throttle body, you know, the aluminum around, you know, the, the, the blade itself. If you have to go more, let's say, than one full turn to get your car to idle, there is a problem. This should only be, just like I said, one full revolution is about it. And you'll have your engine idling between 600 and say 800 RPM, 900 RPM, wherever it happens to, you know, work best for you. Uh, and there's a reason for that. If you go, if you look at the bottom where the blade contacts the body, I don't know, can you see that? Okay. Uh, you'll see a little hole right there. And that little hole corresponds with our next external control, and that's the idle mixture screw. So if we take one of these screws out, you'll see that. At the end of them is a point. And if you were to screw this all the way in, that point would be blocking off that little hole there. Okay? Um, this limits the amount of fuel that the engine sees at idle. Now, and these screws only affect idle. Now, uh, on, on most carburetors, they're at the base over here. On Hollies, you'll find them on the side of the metering blocks. Oh, you know, right about here. But uh, most carburetors have them down in this area. Okay, now the throttle stop screw set where it is is important because if you go any further than that point, you start to uncover what's called the transfer slot. So now I'm going to open the car, I'm going to open this a little bit more and you can see right here there's a slot right? 
Well, when that slot is exposed, you're bypassing the idle mixture. So you no longer can regulate the amount of fuel that's coming through there. If you can't get any type of adjustment out of these idle mixture screws, there is a problem in the passage. And we're going to get to that when we get further inside the carburetor. But that's your idle set screw. Those are your, throttle, those are your idle mixture screws. And it's important that they maintain that relationship so you get a good idle. All right. Now, continuing on the outside, there's a second screw on this carburetor. Actually, all carburetors have a, a high idle screw. On this one, it just happens to be located next to the idle stop screw. This one is attached to the choke. All right, so now let's talk about the choke. Choke systems sent more carbureted cars to the junkyard back in the day than anything else because when they fail it just it just wrecks the way the car runs um, it foul plugs and whatnot it, it won't start right it'll chug and we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute right um, so essentially all chokes operate on the same basic principle here's why you have a choke okay when you go to start the engine you first start the engine there isn't enough vacuum right to pull fuel through the idle passages so what happens is if you close off the top of the carburetor like this with the choke plate what you're doing is you're forcing a hundred percent of the vacuum that the engine produces to pull fuel through these passages once the engine starts vacuum comes up and it'll pull fuel the way it's supposed to at that point this device is supposed to kick in this is the choke pull off so now picture this the engine is closed the engine is is cold you just started it as soon as you start it this this nipple here connects to manifold vacuum so as soon as the engine starts this gets pulled open like that and it pulls the choke about a quarter to a third of the way open. All right, and that's, that keeps the engine from loading up and fouling. Uh, when these go bad, you know, that's, that, that's, it's the simplest thing in the world, but when they go bad, it'll foul the plugs. When the engine is, is cold, they won't clean up. It'll run with a misfire. It's, it's just terrible. So the choke pull-off is a very important part. And one of the things I love about carburetors is, and especially like, like something like this, is that this is adjusted by bending this arm. That's what this little hook is here for. If you need a little bit more choke pull-off, right, you squeeze these ends together. If you got too much, you, you, you bend it and you open, up, you open up the distance. So that's actually how you adjust the choke pull-off by bending that arm. A lot of cars do the same thing with the, cho the choke itself. Uh, the, you'll see that the, the, I don't have a choke on this one obviously, right? But you'll see that the rod will have like a kink in it and that kink is where you would bend it to shorten it or lengthen it so that you've got more or less you know, choke movement here. Um, and of course you've got different types of chokes. This one here uses a thermostatic spring that's in the, in the intake manifold itself. Some cars use an electric choke some cars use a, uh, uh, just a hot gas tube that'll feed into like a, a, a heat well or heat stove. Um, but all chokes are comprised of a metallic spring that relaxes and, and tenses up depending on the temperature. So at any rate, that's the choke and the choke pull-off. All right, externally, what else do we have on this carburetor we need to talk about? Um, okay. This right here is very important. This is the bowl vent. Now, this is an 1870s style carburetor. So it, it had, this was intended to be used with one of those uh, charcoal canisters. So it's got the bowl blocked off here and it has a vent and this vent would go to the charcoal canister. Earlier carburetors would have, uh, like for instance on these BBDs, um, they had just a washer that fit a slotted washer that fit over the accelerator pump hole and all it did was just just lay there and keep debris from falling into the bowl um, but that's that's all it needed it's just, just the carburetor needs 
to be open to the atmosphere. The float bowl needs to be open to the atmosphere so that fuel can flow out of the bowl and into the carburetor itself. But that's the, the, the bowl vent. Um, as far as external controls, I think that's pretty much it. So we can go inside the carburetor now. And um, and again, like I said, all of these systems are, you know, universal, uh, and it's up to you to do the research and figure out how it applies to your carburetor. You know, the thing about carburetors, right, is that, and this moves more proven time and time again. Um, in an ultimate horsepower situation, wide open throttle, right, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a race street, race application, whatever it is, it's been proven time again that the carburetor will outperform EFI. Uh, where EFI has its advantages is in that cold start because you're eliminating the choke, you're using the coolant temp sensor to tell the computer to rich and lean the carburetor as opposed to relying on the thermostatic spring and, and all of that. Uh, and in the, you know, the fact that the uh, fuel injection will, will, will compensate for fuel quality, it'll compensate for altitude, it'll compensate for a lot of things, that the carburetor, it, you know, it, it, it can't. Um, and that's not to say that a carburetor can't be tuned. You know, if you get inside and you, know, you, 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 you tailor everything for exactly the way it's supposed to be, it, carburetor can get within a mile or two per gallon of EFI. If you've got the, the, the choke and everything set right, uh, all of the, the idle passages are all clear and everything's functioning where it's supposed to, there's very, very little difference, functional difference between the carburetor and EFI. You know, the question is how much complication, you know, how much analog control do you want over the machine? How much complication do you want to the system? This is completely self-contained. Boom, here it is. Here's my entire, you know, fuel delivery system as opposed to an EFI system that has, you know, the injectors and the lines and a remote, you know, pump and all that, but it's also got, you know, all of the analog pieces that are in here contained in the computer, you know, and it uses feedback from all these various sensors to make millions of decisions every instant and, you know, and all that. Me, I prefer the simplicity. You know, I can make any change I need to this carburetor using one tool, right? But at any rate, I am the computer. That should be a t-shirt, right? So what's holding this thing together? Right, let's take this off. I did the same thing on the ethanol video yesterday. I forgot to take that clip off. All right. So now we get inside the carburetor. And we'll get to this stuff in a minute. So in here we have, let's take the spring out. The first part of the system is the fuel delivery, how the gasoline gets into the carburetor. And on this one, here's your fuel inlet. And one of the things I love about these BBDs and, and the, the, even the, the carter, the singles, the, the BBS, is that the needle and seat. All right, wait, let's stop here. Let's stop here. If you want to understand, probably before I even go through this, what you should do is pause this video, go in your bathroom, take the lid off of your toilet, okay, the tank, flush the bowl. All right, what you see happening there in that in the toilet tank is exactly, exactly, exactly what's going on in here. So, these are the floats, and in this one, here is the needle and seat. So you don't even have to take the carburetor apart to change the needle and seat on one of these. You just take the fuel line off and pop this out. So. In general, this is the most troublesome part of any carburetor. When people say, oh, that thing is shot, it's dead, right? It's blowing gas all over the place. This is where the problem lies. And generally what happens is one of two things goes bad. Either through age, right? Um, okay, wait, let's, let's go further. The job of the needle and seat, right, is to shut off the flow of fuel to the carburetor. So fuel lines coming in, fuel pump is pumping fuel in, and this is a restriction. The bowl, the, the, the floats, 
you know, floats that are made out of, out of plastic and all sorts of phalanic resins and whatnot, but typically, usually, they're made out of brass. They're soldered brass floats just like this. And this tab right here contacts the needle valve. So when the fuel level drops, the floats drop, the needle valve comes out, and fuel is allowed to enter. As, the, as the, the fuel in the bowl rises to the level it's supposed to be, it shuts that valve off and shuts off the flow of fuel. Now when they go bad, one of two things happens. Either this wears to the point that it won't seat completely into the, into the seat the way it's supposed to, or, and this is very common today, you'll get a little piece of rubber from a fuel line or a tiny piece of, of rust will get in there and it'll keep this from closing all the way when the, the, the float comes up and, and, and pushes on it. Um, when that happens, it'll just flood gasoline over the top through it and you'll see it mostly come out of the bowl vent. But you can actually see it pour over the top. You'll see it dripping into the boosters. Um, generally, that's all it takes, you know, to, okay. So, if you have that problem, all you want to do is give the carburetor a couple of taps. And what that will do is dislodge whatever happens to be stuck in that needle and seat. Um, get you down the road. But that's like the number one troublesome part, you know, that's carburetor failure 101 right there. All right, so now back to the floats. Float height is set by bending this tab. So let's go back, let's drop this in. We need this piece. I've also seen a lot of people put these in backwards. You know, I've, I've, I've had a couple of them where you take it apart, you know, the carpet is junk in it. They, they actually put this in backwards. The, the pointy end goes into the seat assembly. All right. So now the fuel level is important. Um, when the, the correct level of fuel is such that it's below the discharge holes in the boosters. Um, if you have the fuel level set too high, so let's say the, the, the floats are up like this and the fuel is way up here. What will happen is as you're driving down the road, fuel will just be sloshing over into the boosters. The one indication, one really good indication that the float level is set too high uh, is that you'll make a turn, right, and the car will stumble and, and, and you know, surge. Or you'll step on the brakes and the car will, like, start to, like, lumber and, and go to die. That means that the bowl, the float level is set too high and that fuel is sloshing around inside the carburetor. Conversely, if you don't have enough fuel level in there, let's say the bowls are set to shut off the needle and seat, let's say at that level there, what will happen is you'll run out of gas, uh, or the, the bowl will run out of gas because the, the, the engine will suck the fuel out of the bowl, but it can't be replenished quickly enough through the needle and seat assembly, so it'll just fall on its face and stumble and die. So attaining the correct float height is like really important to overall performance. Uh, and like I said, on these, on these uh, uh, Carter style carburetors, the, the level is set by bending this tab back and forth. Primitive, but it works. On Hollies, it's set, if, if you ever see it on a Holly carburetor, you've got that 5 8 nut and the slotted uh, screw up at the top. Well, by turning that, you're raising and lowering the level of the uh, the float height. You can watch a YouTube tutorial on how to set Holly float heights. Um, but that's the fuel delivery system into the engine. Um, now, the next the next part of it is how the engine actually gets its primary fuel, and that would be through the jets. Now, the jets on these carburetors are down here at the bottom of the bowl. Okay, so. When vacuum signal is strong enough, the throttle is open, right? I'm going to open the throttle. Throttle's open. Engine vacuum has a clear shot at, through these boosters here. And what it'll do is it'll pull fuel through, the, it creates a low pressure area, 
that pulls fuel from the jet through here and then into the engine and internal combustion happiness happens. And it's really that simple. Um, Hollies have a different jetting system, you know, they, 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 well, the same system, but the jets are screwed like into the metering block, you know, this way and on Carters and, and, and Edelbrocks, they're from the bottom. Uh, each cylinder, each, each, each throttle bore is going to have a jet. So, there's also a metering system that goes with this. And again, like I didn't want to get into the specific difference between, differences between Hollies and Edelbrocks and all of that. But uh, this metering rod system that I'm about to show you is unique to the Carters, Edelbrocks, Strombergs, uh, lots of different carburetors. Hollies use what's called a power valve. And what this is, is, okay, it's a vacuum sensitive fuel metering uh, 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 system. When the throttle is open, you're past the, the transfer slots and you're actually pulling fuel through the boosters. Depending on engine vacuum, right? So, so your foot's open, uh, the RPM is starting to come up, right? Uh, it needs as much fuel as the jet is gonna flow to make the power. So if you look, these are metering rods. These fit into the jets, and you'll see that it's tapered, right? It's skinny at, at, the, at the top, right, at the tip, and then it gets fatter as you go. And what happens is, when engine vacuum, when manifold vacuum falls off, these, this is spring-loaded, okay? The spring overcomes vacuum and pulls these rods out of the jets, so you get full flow. Now, let's say you've maintained your foot on the throttle in that in that same position and now the car has accelerated to where you want it to be but it's not going to accelerate anymore it's reached cruising speed at that point manifold vacuum comes up and when manifold vacuum comes up it pulls these metering rods down into the jets so that instead of the small area you know in the jet the thicker area goes into the jet and that cuts off or it limits the amount of fuel it's able to go through the jet. And you can tune, you know, how much it's getting low speed or high speed by changing these metering rods for, for thicker or thinner rods. Holly uses what's called a power valve. And the power valve works on the same principle. You know, when engine vacuum is high, right, uh, it's closed. It's not allowing anything, any extra fuel through the system. When engine vacuum drops off, the power valve opens because it senses the demand and it sends more fuel in. Now, fuel enrichment, there is another, there's another very important, like super important part of every carburetor. It's called the accelerator pump. And that's what this is. The accelerator pump is a plunger, okay? Well, actually, on a Holley, see, Holley is different. Holley's use a diaphragm, but either way, the principle is the same. The purpose of the accelerator pump, right, picture this now. You're sitting there at idle, okay? Um, the throttle is closed. You open the throttle. When you open the throttle, vacuum automatically falls off. And because the vacuum goes away, the, the engine can't pull fuel through, those, through the, the passages that it would normally pull fuel through. So what the accelerator pump does is it gives a squirt of it, just raw gas, just right into the carburetor. And what that does is that, that feeds the engine until vacuum can come up and it can actually start to pull fuel through the, 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 the jets and all those other good passages that are in there. Um, it, with the accelerator pump not functioning, when you stepped on the gas, the engine would just sputter and die. Nothing would happen. So, uh, super important. Um, and, and, you know, getting the adjustment on this right, again, Depending on the type of carburetor that you've got, you can watch countless different tutorials on how to set and how to adjust and, and whatnot, you know, the accelerator pump to work, you know, so. Uh, but that's its essential function. It's to just squirt raw fuel into the engine before, the, before vacuum builds up high enough that it can pull fuel through on its own. Um, and I think that 
pretty much covers systems. The only other thing I want to talk about was um, was 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 a peculiarity that, that that that's universal to all carburetors. It's only peculiar because it kind of defies common sense until it's explained to you. Um, a lot of guys will have problems with with low speed operation. Um, they're not able to get a clean idle out of it, or or, or they're going to rebuild the carburetor and they go to clean out. You know the passages, the idle passages, and common sense would say to yourself, well, you know, the idle passage, you know, it's well, here's the screw, and here's the hole, and here's the fuel bowl, so here's the gas. The holes must be here someplace, right? No. The idle circuitry has to be higher than the level of fuel that's in the bowl under normal circumstances. So, in other words. And the reason for that is because if it was at the same level, when you shut when you shut the car off, the fuel from the bowl would just drain down through those idle holes. So the idle circuitry is actually incorporated into this booster assembly. On a, on a Holley, it's into the metering block, but the idle passages would actually have to come up to the top of the carburetor above the level of fuel before they can actually go down and deliver fuel into the engine. So when you've got a, a clogged idle circuitry, you're going to find it up in here, not down in there. Um, and you know what? I think, I think that pretty much covers like the basics. I think that I forget anything. I don't think I forgot anything. But if I did, look, I hope you got something out of this. Again, you know, I have to work in, in total generalities here because there are so many specifics and so many idiosyncrasies to so many different carburetors. So you have to do your own, you know, your own research on your setup. But what I showed you here, you know, is you know, there are universal systems. And uh, you get a handle on that and, you know, you can have a really great relationship with your carburetor. You know, if you don't take the time to understand how they work and do the homework and everything else, then honestly, you know, you're really better off just putting fuel injection on it. It's the simple turnkey, you know, forget it and go, way to go. Uh, but anyway, that's it. I'll see you tomorrow.